Hello and welcome back to dance history or introduction to dance history rather. In this module we are discussing classical ballet, a reminder that each module includes a resource sheet and that resource sheet is a link to videos to help you further dive into um, studying or learning more about the dance. I also want to say that with this module you begin reading the required section for our dance at court. If you finish that reading, then you're all done. If you have not, do you do want to visit it, revisit it, because you will need that information to um, help you complete the quiz and our submissions. Our learning objectives for this module include how did ballet develop? What are characteristics of the technique? What are some major eras in the ballet in ballet history and their characteristics? Who are influential figures of these ballet periods? What are some historical events that influence the development of ballet? And how does ballet and the ballet dancer look today? The term ballet means a choreographed dance performed on a stage that uses scenery, costume, and music to tell story. Therefore, it's storytelling, which is a cultural expression. So I just gave you the definition of ballet. So based on that definition, any dance form can be a ballet. So a, a ballet can make use of hip hop. A ballet can make use of West African dance forms or South African dance forms or Asian dance forms. But what we're going to discuss in this module is classical ballet. And classical ballet refers to a dance form that um, began in during the Italian Renaissance, but we'll also discuss how some of the groundwork for the Italian Renaissance was laid before the actual it Italian Renaissance, excuse me. In the case of classical ballet, we see the evolution of a social dance into a codified technique. This is similar to the developments of jazz and breakdance, their um, social dance forms. So right now, I want you to think of, imagine that we're standing in a room and it's at a party or some other relaxed event, and I turn the radio on. Your go-to movement is social dance or the movement that the person that's across from you starts doing, that's the social dance. And what we see in ballet is how that social dance form developed and became a codified technique. I want you to remember that movement because I might call back on it later. Characteristics of ballet as we know it right now. Make use of the turnout, which is an outward rotation of your legs beginning at the hip, use of a pointed foot, which is actually a stretching of your ankle, which then um, has your toes pointing down towards the ground, an emphasis on graceful fluid movement, and movement that seems to defy gravity. So the dancers are pushing away from the ground and um, with these soft, smooth, graceful movements that... Um, Almost, they almost seem effortless, but we know that they're not effortless because we know that all bodily movement requires effort and force. There's a focus on vertical alignment, which means that the head and spine, head, spine, and pelvis, excuse me, are in an alignment, meaning that they make one line. Revisiting something that we mentioned before, classical art. Ballet does fall into the arena of classical art because it is an established art form that spans an, a long time. In this case, this long time is several hundreds of years. Um, but that long time is short when we compare it to some of the Asian classical dance forms that are thousands of years old, right? So understanding that long is relative dependent upon the culture in which it's developed in. The art is, has been endorsed by a powerful force of society. We'll mention some of those forces as we go along. 
and the art has a devoted core of performers, patrons, and audience. Some of the eras that we'll, we're going to discuss in this module are the spectacle, ballet at court, ballet d'action, the romantic era, and the era of ballet russe. I would like to say that this lecture is going to be a little longer than um, some of our previous lectures because there is a lot to cover. Please feel free to stop this at any moment in time that you need to and come back to it. Um, but we're going to keep going if you're still with me. This is a slide that you've seen before in our dance and religion module. And I am bringing it back because dance is not linear. And dance history is not linear in that History is a collection of stories that are based on societal and political events. So if something happens in a society, if something, ha yeah, if something happens in a society, it's going to affect the people. And part of that effect is, is, are the dance forms that are developed. So it's going to affect several different dance forms because dance forms develop alongside of one another. In this slide, we talked about Cicero and how Cicero, Cicero, excuse me, attitude towards dance. And we talked about after Cicero's death, we see a influx in the pantomime. We also saw that the pantomime was not liked by early Christians. So this reminds us of those attitudes and how attitudes can be based on your culture. Your culture includes your beliefs and your values as they relate to religion and other things. The Italian Renaissance is, or yes, is something that happened during the 14th through the 17th century. There was a renewed interest in the classics of Roman and, and Greek history. The combination of the secular masquerades, religious processionals, and this portrayal of mythology is what was the foundational work, some of the foundational work towards the ballet. The Medici family is a family that its name is um, an important name as it relates to ballet. And one of the Medici, Lorenzo, was known for having these parades that um, would have people hanging off of the flow and they, they would chant and there would be movement. Um, and also these banquets, the family would have these banque banquets, excuse me, with a mythological theme. So the mythology, right? Remember dance at court, the noble family, the family that you're visiting, they're having these events. And during these events, the gods, or the people playing the gods are um, talking about why this family is wonderful, why this family is great, um, political space. It is a space of politics, right? Um, it's, it's dance and this event as a tool to reiterate why this family is important. In the 16th century, we see these semi-staged social dances with these lavish representations, right? So go back to your, um, go back to your dance, your go-to movement, and have in mind that when these events are happening, they're using that movement right there. So it's not a uh, very rehearsed, polished, pristine performance of the movement. These are social dances. Captain Medici brings this tradition and her dance master to France when she weds. But as I said, um, some of that groundwork is mentioned in the in the 14th century or during the Italian Renaissance, but realistically what part of what um, set the ground for the Italian Renaissance happened before that. And it happened in relation to Hebrew and Islam. So I wrote the Abrahamic influence because they are Abrahamic religions. Hebrew and Jewish synonymous, right? Uh, uh, in this case, because depending on the period in time and the perspective of the person is going to tell you, is going to choose which term they use. Another, ter another term that's synonymous or I want you to have a deeper understanding of is more. 
the more in this case is a reference to people that are that either practice Islam and or people that are from of North African descent. So setting that groundwork for the Italian Renaissance. So there's a golden age, be, see the dates right there, where Jewish people were exiled from the Roman Empire and they found a new home in Spain. During that same time, Spain was under occupation of uh, the Moors. They were actually under that occupation for about 800 years. So up into, until 1492, when Isabella and Ferdinand kick all of the Muslims and the Jewish people out. So during that 800 year time, um, we see an influx in the sciences and scholarly work because it was a part of Islamic practice that everyone be educated. So during that time, we see um, a lot of progression in, in the sciences specifically uh, as it relates to astronomy, chemistry, physics, mathematics, and philosophy because the Moors traveled. So they'd gone east, they picked up new sciences and information from the east in China and other parts of Asia. And then they traveled across uh, North Africa into West Africa and up into, and then up into, um, into Spain. The Moors carried with them the Greek and Roman classics as well as the Bible. And they taught this information to everyone. Later in time, Jewish scholars would uh, work with the Christian monks to translate all of these works back into Latin. So that means that when, when the Jewish people and when um, Islam comes back to Italy, they are bringing with them all of this information that was lost because the Moors in their traveling have just been collecting the information and sharing the information. This all lays the groundwork for the Italian Renaissance, right? Because now they have their information back. They have a, a wonderful collective of the information they can dive back into it. So even with the Medici family, Alessandro Medici, the last ruling Medici, the Duke of Florence and Penne was a Moor. So we see how certain culture, religion and beliefs and values lead to certain political events, lead to lead to uh, expressions of that culture and that value. So I want to bring this up because within Islamic culture, there was this practice of song and dance as a form of entertainment. So essentially, the first um, troubadour, who was a person that walked around and, and sang and danced and gave history, was actually of Moorish, Moorish descent. Right. So we see this idea of singing, giving history, uh, entertainment. We see that groundwork led in place and informed by the Moors. Important figures, Catherine Medici, Guglielmo Abero, Thorno Arbo, Balthasar Beaujouet, and Louis and King Louis XIV. A thing that I want to point out in this slide, this all of this information is in your book, so I'm not going to dive too deep into it. I'm just bringing it up as a reminder. Um, the changing in the, of names as people move from region to region. So Balthazar, who was um, with, it was Italian, there's a different spelling of his name when he comes into France. Also, Guglielmo Abero literally translates to William the Hebrew, right? So if you're, if you're doing research, you, you want to know that these people are the same people. There is a tradition of, um, well, not a tradition, but it's not uncommon for people to change the spelling of their names when they come into a different area for different reasons, sometimes to make it easier on the people that are there to say their names, sometimes they just need a change, but it is not uncommon. We'll see this also in our jazz unit. So the king and queen, two very important people, not to say that other people are less important, but people that we will continue to talk about in our trajectory of this course. Um, 
Catherine Medici. So she marries at 14 and she brings those uh, that those traditions with her to France from uh, these traditions of the account, the Italian court to France. She's known as being an art supporter. Um, and some say this is because art was her go to her like safe space. When Catherine comes to court, her husband already has a um a partner there. He already has he already has a partner there and she's been there. So people know her, people talk to her, and it doesn't leave as much space for Catherine to take her place. If you are like me and you watch TV, um we see this in the show Rain. Um R E I-G-N, this scenario plays out because it is a historical um, based show. Notice the year that um, that of Catherine's life. Oh, I also want to go back to that other slide. 1492 is when um, Isabella and Ferdinand exiled Jewish people and and Muslims from from Spain. That is also the same year that Christopher Columbus uh, travels to North America, landing in Cuba. That'll be important later. So we also have King Louis XIV, who was a bourbon. Yes, like the alcohol. He ruled from Versailles, which is a part of France. Um, his court was known to be intense and in, as it related to protocol and etiquette. At King Louis's court, Everything was codified, including language. So there was a book that was written that said, like, when someone says this to you, you need to say this back to them. Everything was codified at his court. He was also a dancer. When he, when the sun settles on his dance career, he establishes the Royal Academy, and that's in the year 1661. So in 1661, the U.S., while has not even become the United States of America, at this point, there are colonies in here in the U.S., but we are not the United States of America at this point. So the spectacle, we talked about this a little more, but just to give us a quick run back, run through the spectacle, these amateur theatrical events held by the nobles that uh, use Greek and Roman mythology. Roman should have been capitalized. Roman mythology. These theatrics use social dance, and they're considered the pre-classics, right? Um, dances fell into two categories. The basse, which was slow steps, and the holt, which was um, jumps and hops. In some of my research, they say that the the basse allowed the older women to come in and uh, make presents, while the the faster rhythms allowed the younger women to show their how agile and how light they were um, and their abilities. So this also kind of makes me think of the ingree that we talked about, right? The ingree is a jumping movement, but it also, it allowed the older women to show that they could still jump, right? Gracefully still jump. Just a reminder of where we are, the Bellettis, the Medici family, and that Catherine bought this to, with her to France. So, ooh, Comique de Lorraine, the first, it's the first, right? It's considered one of the first ballets, although it would not look like ballet as we know it right now. Um, in my research, I found different times for how long uh, it lasted, but all of my research says that it was at least five hours. So in 1581, there is a marriage of uh, Francis and Mary Stewart, and this Comique de Lorraine is commissioned by Catherine to celebrate the, wed the wedding. So there, uh, Beaujouet creates this beautiful libretto that... Um, copies the music and gives note on like the some aspects of the choreography but not the actual movements so 
Um, just think about it like maybe formations and things like that, but you don't know what they're actually doing. And it's believed that there's no na- notation of the actual movements performed because they were social dances. You know, if I turn on a certain song, everybody's going to do a certain dance. So there was no need to notate the dance. This is also this idea that we see in the case of Comique de la Reine, but also we see it later in the U.S. is why this history course, in this dance history course, I charge you with writing the dance in a way, documenting the dance in a way, describing the dance in a way that someone in the future could look at the submissions that you offered me and have an idea of the videos that we watch. Even if the technology wasn't still around, they could look at those submissions, they could read those submissions and have an understanding of the movement. What does it take to be a good dancer? Well, here are six qualifications that Uh, some of our dance masters came up with. Rhythm, memory, space, use of space, knowing how to use space, lightness, the ability to lightly jump (laughs) and not shake the floor, coordination, and an inclination to expression. Why inclination to expression? Because of the Panama. In 1717, there's a libretto Uh, made for watching dances because the pantomime is used. There was an example of some gestures used in a pantomime. But there were so many of them that in 1750, there was like a, there was a, um, come on now, like let's have a, a unified universal norms of the pantomime so that people can know they don't need the libretto to come in and cause Prior to 1750, you would need this book to actually understand what was going on in the ballet because you'll see. You needed those notes to understand what was going on in the ballet because ballet at court, dance at court, in the European court, in the French court, there was not a through line. There was a lack of continuity in the content. All of the dances followed a prescribed uh, order. So regardless of what the theme was supposed to be about, there was a, this happens here, this happens here, this happens here. The stories were told through pantomime rather than a dance, which is why you needed that that book to understand what was going on. Um, Well, you need that book later to understand what was going on. And in addition to that, people were wearing masks. So you can't see their facial expressions and there's restrictive movement because the women have on corsets. So their torsos are um, restricted in movement and they have on these heavy skirts. So they can't, they don't have range of motion, their range of motion with their lower half either. In 17, uh, I mean, not in 1727, in 1727 is when he was born. So Nouvert comes with these revolutionary ideas ballet movement should be both technically brilliant and expressive enough to emotionally move the audience the plot should be in alignment with everything else there's a through line the scenery the music the costumes they should all relate and we gotta we gotta simplify the panama Novare comes in with these revolutionary ideas and prior to his revolutionary ideas he was on tenure at the Royal Academy. He lost that tenure due to these revolutionary ideas. The ideas are still used, but he did lose his job. This at the Royal Academy, that is. This act begins what is known as the Ballet Dax Young. In addition to this change in what's happening on stage, we also see a change in the stage, right? Uh, prior to this, there was a loss of the theaters and um, churches served as theaters or served as pl- places where you could see entertainment. But because there are churches, the content is about the Bible, Outdoor performances were held at marketplaces, but still, once again, 
they they had Bible references. It is not, so in 1661, when the Royal Academy is established by the, the now retired King Louis XIV, retired from dancing, um, this opens up the door to access to dance. The proscenium stage, so this raised stage. Now that the dancers are on the stage and they're away from you, we see what is known as the fourth wall. There's a separation between the performer and uh, everyone else. There's a performer, there's an air quote artist, there's a dancer now, right? This is not just a dinner party where the person is, you're sitting on the same level and you can dag on there, reach out and touch that person. There's a clear line that separates you and there is a clear understanding that you are here to observe this thing, not to participate in it. This allows the French public to also view dance. So now you don't have to be invited to court to see these dances and these productions. You can pay for a ticket. In this development, we begin to see, or we see two of the first rivals. This is, these people are mentioning your book, so I'm not going to go deep into them. But what I am going to mention is that Camargo, Camargo, excuse me, shortened her, her dress, which was against the rules. But she shortened her dress so that she could have some more range of motion. This caused a lot of uproar, but it also changed fashion because Camargo was, was a highborn. She was an aristocrat. So what she did was seen by a lot of people and people wanted to be like that. So this has a change in the way that women are dressing. I also want to um, point out that Sal, so these women both have the same name, same first name, which is why I'm referring to them by their last name, danced until her 40s. The average ballet dancer in today's world is not going to dance into their 40s, not performing at least. Um, they might teach class still, but not dancing all the way into their 40s. So more people that are listed in your reading, I want to bring up Beauchamp because he is given credit for the terminology and the ballet rules that we know today. The romantic era. So we're getting close to that tat. So go ahead and take that break if you need that break right now. Get a sip of water. But we're jumping into this romantic era. A disillusioned reaction against the excess of war and politics. A desire to get away from the grim truth. So what was going on? How do we define the uh, the Romantic era? So it began around 1831 with the Ballet of the Nuns and it ended around 1870s. And what we see on stage is a shift in focus. The ballets are focusing on real life experiences or this idea of getting away from real life experiences. There are two ballets that would be considered uh, romantic era ballets, even though they fit outside of the year, they fit into the characteristics of what's inside of the movement. I'll explain that a little more. So why would people want, want to get away? Okay, here's what's happened. The French Revolution. By this time, the U.S. is established, right? Because it's 1789 and um, the U.S. is established in 1776. There's a political uh, change, right? There's a turn from monarchy into a feudal system. Frank is go Frank France is going bankrupt in part because they are spending money in the U.S. The royal coffers are depleted. People are hungry. There's been a drought. The cattle, so the meat is like not good. Um, we see a another. Uh, level of population, not level of population, but like we see this, uh, what's the best word? Class. There's another class. Develop. There are, that are not aristocrats and not like folk, air quote. Um, 1793, the reign of terror. So French aristocrats and dancers are fleeing because people are being executed. Now remember what we said about 
court dance, dance at court, and classical dance, right? It has to be supported by people in power. So if the people in power are going, those dancers that were being supported, they had to go too. Some of them had to go too. Description of the technique. So in earlier in the year, I said dance is a physical manifestation of the culture, right? So what's going on in society, what's going on in politics, there's a turnout that we see on stage because you're on the stage, you're up higher. You can you want to see the body in a different kind of way. We see the use of the pointed foot. We see the um, graceful movement. We see this vertical stuff. Like this is where we begin to see the development of the technique because there is a change in or more development of the technique because there is a change in what's going on in the world. So rom- Characteristics of the Romantic era outside of like that body positioning and things that we see developing in the ballet technique is the focus on the actual technique, right? So that focus on a technique and a shift from the gods to uh, the phantasm. So ghosts and nymphs and those kind of creatures, a lack of gods and goddesses because the gods and goddesses were giving um, accolades to the nobles. And we're not concentrating on the nobles anymore. We're concentrating on everyday life. And you're like, hey, my life is great. Or, hey, my life is not great. It's going to be better when I die and go to heaven. And what will happen when I die and go to heaven? And how will it look? So this idea of escaping this the negative things that are happening right now and um, focusing on these other ethereal things. Within a romantic era on the stage, you're also going to see these nods to your your local or national heritage. And that's going to come via like costumes or the set. So the set looking like houses that people in your area live or people that are performing would actually live in. So there's a... Um, can rather than giving accolades and praise to the noble family and to gods, we're going to give the accolades and the praise to us. We mentioned the technique. During this time, we see more turnout. We see the port de bras and we see a shift in the focus of the man. So the man was the person that was jumping really high and spinning really fast. And now the man steps into the role of the partner more because we're highlighting the female dancer. We also begin to see 1860s. So 1860s means that at this point, the U.S. is going through the Civil War. This is when we see... um, the pointed shoe. Additionally on stage, we have all this technology going, all this technology. We begin to see things like the dim lights, the smoke, the machines that with trap doors. Why? Because we have to give off that essence of like being out in the woods and the woodland creatures coming up. So we have to, we, we can make atmosphere now, right? The creation of otherworldly ideas. We have softer lights because we have electricity and technology, right? We have softer costumes because there's an advancement. So what's going on in society directly affects what's going on on stage. The focus on the ballerina. So beginning in the 1820s, we see this shift to the ballerina now playing a supernatural being. Taglioni, Marie Taglioni, introduces the tutu in 1830, and she's uh, considered the first soloist of the Paris Opera. Fanny Essler is brought up in your book, in your reading. Um, I want to make mention of the fact that it, it that Fanny was considered pagan. We've used this term before, right? We understand what it means to be pagan. But these, that idea of being pagan and the dances associated with her religious practice made her an excellent character dance because those dances were then infused into the ballet, right? So this is why we talk about this ballet being the use of social dance forms and some religious dance forms, so cultural dance forms. Mm, 
I don't really like cultural dance forms, but uh, extensions of your culture, right? The the way that you dance outside of this outside of the stage is what gives um, what informs what you do on the stage. I also want to note that when Fanny Essler comes to the U.S. Congress shuts down because they want to see her dance. She shut down Congress. Giselle is Giselle, excuse me, is a ballet from the Romantic era. It's one that you're going to watch. Um, it began as a two act ballet. It first premiered in 1841, and it was choreographed by Perot and Carilli. Uh, composed by Adolph Adam and restaged by, excuse me, restaged by Petty Pie. So here's your tat number 12. It's a video analysis. Your task is to write a two paragraph response. I'm going over this here, but you know that you, um, reminder, not you know, reminder that you have to submit via the tat. Um, your task is a is to write a two paragraph response. That means the format of this tet is a two is two paragraphs. The first paragraph is contextual knowledge. What were New Verve's precepts? How did they differ from ballet at court? Right? How did the structure like? How was he? Why were they revolutionary? What was he trying to do? What was it a shift to? What are characteristics of ballet technique? And what was going on socially? Or politically, like what was going on in history during the time of the Romantic era? Because we know that what was going on in the world uh, informs what's going on on stage. That's your first paragraph. So you're setting the reader up. You want them to know what they're about, like what was going on, what they're, what it, what it is. And then the second paragraph, you're going to describe what's in the video. So this paragraph includes at least five base sentences, a minimum of five base sentences. Each sentence breaks down the movement of a singular body part. This is a larger paragraph because in addition to that, you have two connection sentences. Those connection sentences are written down there. So we want to make sure. So I like to think of it in this kind of way. I'm going to describe the thing that happened on stage. And then I'm going to make reference to something that I that I gave in the first paragraph, right? So this is what happened on stage. This is connected to this, or this could be connected to something that you mentioned in the first paragraph. If there are any questions, please make sure that you email me prior to the submission so that I have a chance to respond to your email and that you have a chance to make a change or do the work in in regards to or after we I give you your response. Please have a wonderful day. Please be safe.